we would like to welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Lisa Collins. Dr. Collins is an attending physician in the Emotion and Development Branch at the National Institute of Mental Health in Bethesda, Maryland. Dr. Collins is an adjunct assistant professor of psychiatry, behavioral sciences, and pediatrics at George Washington University School of Medicine in Washington, DC. She has devoted most of her career to training and education, community psychiatry and systems of care, in particular, working with children and adolescents in the child welfare system and other underserved populations. Today, she is here to share with us her presentation titled, A Conversation About Compassion Fatigue. At the end of the presentation, Dr. Collins will answer questions posed by the audience. You may submit a question at any point in the presentation by using the Q&A feature in your Zoom toolbar. Welcome, Dr. Collins. Thank you so much. I was literally in panic mode because my share screen was not working. So oh, I'm better now. Um, okay, and I'm, I am technically challenged, so hopefully all will go well. Good Saturday morning. Um, thank you so much for having me today, um, especially to speaking to all of you in this context um, as well. So today I want to talk about compassion fatigue. And um, on this good Sunday morning, we probably are just feeling some fatigue. It could uh, relate to some compassion fatigue, but it just might be because it's Saturday morning. Um, but anyway, so we're going to get into this topic. And, um, and once again, thank you so much for having me. So the title of my presentation is, I'm tired. Okay, and I'm going to raise my hand to say that I think I've said that many times, especially over the context of these past two years. But translating it is, in other words, vicarious trauma, compassion fatigue, burnout. How do you help and refuel? Uh -oh. Oh. Okay, I see I'm hitting the wrong buttons. Okay, so our objectives for today is to know the difference between burnout, vicarious trauma, compassion fatigue, and secondary trauma. Um, I will say this, that really compassion fatigue is sort of the overarching um, context and vicarious trauma, secondary trauma, and burnout sort of kind of pocket under that, underneath that umbrella, but we'll get into those details for sure. Uh, recognize the signs and mitigation strategies of vicarious trauma, compassion fatigue, burnout, and secondary trauma, and then also identify and develop strategies to promote provider well-being. Okay, so I'm I'm a big uh, supporter of just like basic definitions. So I'm literally going to read the Merriam-Webster dictionary definition of trauma. So it means multiple things: an injury such as a wound to living tissue caused by an extrinsic agent, a disordered psychic or behavioral state resulting from severe mental or emotional stress or physical injury, an emotional upset. Okay, now according to the American Psychiatric Association, trauma is exposure to actual or threatened death, serious injury or sexual violence in one or more of the following ways directly experiencing the traumatic event, witnessing in person the traumatic event as it occurred to others, learning that the traumatic event occurred to a close family member or a close friend in case of actual threatened death of a family member or friend, the events must have been violent or accidental, experiencing repeated or extreme exposure to adversive uh, details of the traumatic event. Now, um, you know, sort of the, the, at times the easy part, um, I understand I'm speaking to an audience, um, it's a special education uh, conference. So one, let me just kind of take a few steps back. I, I bow down to all of you as a child and as a psychiatrist, um, 
educational staff are near and dear to my heart. They are an extension of my clinical work, my clinical team could not do what I do without you all. Um, you know my patients and families better than I do because my, my patients are your students and they spend eight, eight hours a day with you. So I, I cannot say enough how much I appreciate you and the work that you do. And so with that, um, you are frontline. And so uh, perhaps to you, um, you know, discovering the signs and symptoms of trauma in kids might be something that you see um, quite frequently and you might see it even before I see it. So when those kiddos get to me. So behavioral and emotional signs may include hypervigilance, hyperarousal, so that's increased restlessness, increased startup response, avoidance or poor sleep, irritability, withdrawal, poor concentration, becoming easily frustrated and easily distracted. Um, there could be unfortunately clear physical signs of abuse. Um, when thinking about trauma, we cannot and must not forget the impact of racism, economic disadvantage, so food and housing insecurities, family unit transitions, and fragilities and instability. And I want to underscore this bullet point um, because many people sort of envision trauma, a traumatic event as just this, this natural you know, disaster or something um, terrible has happened. But please know that the things that I just mentioned the impact of racism, economic disadvantage, food and housing insecurities, family unit transitions, fragilities and instability um, is equated to a natural disaster as well. And um, as we've all experienced in the context of, that, of this pandemic have been amplified. And so with that, I know that as educational um, providers that you have seen this in your students and your families. Um, so what can you do? So you listen, you continue to provide a consistent nurturing classroom setting. You may connect them with the school psychologist. There's encouragement, there's patience and understanding. So once again, I, I believe that you all are pros at this because you've seen it quite often. So now, unfortunately, in my slides, the toolbar is, is blocking some things on my slides, but um, from this illustration, you can't pour from an empty cup. Take care of yourself first. So we might see the signs and symptoms in others, but it's so important that we focus on our self-care in this context as well. So as we think about this broad context, um, I think it's important um, as we kind of journey in our careers and in our everyday lives is to reflect upon why do we do the work that we do, okay? How do you measure success in your work? What are the costs and rewards of this work and how are you personally changing? And, Perhaps you're very reflective on a daily basis as you raise your hand and say, I'm tired, help. Um, but it's important uh, to, to think about these questions. You know, what, what keeps us going? What gets us up? Um, what takes us into that school building and, and confront what, you know, you all confront? And, um, you know, that second bullet point, how do you measure success in your work? So that really factors in at times when we begin to talk about burnout and we talk about compassion fatigue. And what are the costs and rewards of this work and how are you personally changing? So how does it um, contribute to your own personal growth? So I love this quote. So we have not been directly exposed to the trauma scene, but we hear this story told with such intensity, or we hear similar stories so often, or we have the gift and curse of extreme empathy and we suffer. We feel the feelings of our clients. We experience their fears. We dream their dreams. Eventually we lose a certain spark of optimism, humor and hope. We tire, we aren't sick, but we aren't ourselves. I really love this quote, especially as a clinician. Um, it just really resonates with me because, you know, as we are all joined together, we do this work and, um, 
you know, our work is 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 um, is so intricately entwined in listening and hearing stories. And so this this really resonates with me. So these concepts different but connected. So as you can see, sort of this this cycle. Um, and it's kind of where does it all start? So, but burnout, vicarious trauma, compassion, fatigue, secondary trauma. Okay, so some quick definitions, and it's kind of confusing, but here we go. And sort of what I said at the beginning. Um, so vicarious trauma, it is the cumulative transformative effect upon the professional who is working with survivors of traumatic life events. Okay, keyword here, it's cumulative transformative effect. Secondary trauma is the emotional and psychological effects experienced through vicarious exposure to the details of the traumatic experiences of others. Now we'll get into this in the next slide, but the key component to secondary trauma, it is, it's almost, it's immediate. And the, the experience or the symptoms that, um, that, that professional experiences um, almost mirror the, the symptoms of the actual survivor of the traumatic event. Compassion fatigue, as I mentioned previously, is sort of like this, this umbrella. And so vicarious trauma and secondary trauma come underneath that umbrella. And this is where you know, these sort of terms are utilized interchangeably at times, but it's that emotional residue of exposure to working with those suffering from consequences of traumatic events. So even if someone experiences secondary trauma, over time, that residue will be there. So that compassion fatigue. Now burnout, which is something a little bit different, is associated with work stress. Feelings resulting as things that inspire passion, enthusiasm are stripped away at times and or are tedious, unpleasant things crowd in, okay? Now, unfortunately I cannot see any of you. I wish I could. Uh, but, uh, you know, if we were all in the room together, I would say, okay, raise your hand, raise your hand. So my, my hand is up high. I think, uh, in most of our professional lives, there have been these little moments of time where we've felt some burnout in the context of our positions, whatever it might be. And somehow we may either work through it, whatever it might be. Um, please, anyone, you know, chat, let us know if there you have found that career choice or position where it's never, you've never experienced it. But this does happen at times, and this might bubble in a little bit. So vicarious trauma, what is it? So once again, the transformation of the inner experience of the therapist and this is professional, um, that comes about as the result of empathic engagement with the client's traumatic material. Okay, so once again, keyword, transformation, empathic engagement. It's gradual change, cumulative process. So it is not counter-transference, which is really a psychodynamic concept in the concept of therapy, um, which, you know, interfaces with conscious, unconscious feelings, all of that. I won't delve into that too much. It is not burnout. You know, burnout is separate. It's a syndrome and burnout is syndrome. So that is the emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, feelings of inadequacy, reduced personal accomplishment. Um, you know, it can, some of the risks can be work overload, low satisfaction in your job roles. Sometimes they change. Um, and it does not have to be due to trauma at all. And then once again, we've got the overarching compassion fatigue, but then secondary um, post-traumatic stress or secondary trauma. So this is a disorder of sorts. Uh, as I mentioned previously, it can be rapid onset. It can be temporary. This is where I kind of put that, uh, that slash with the compassion fatigue where over time, then it can bubble into that compassion fatigue, but it's the emotional duress experienced by persons having close contact with a trauma survivor. Symptoms can be re-experiencing the client's trauma, avoidance, numbing, persistent arousal. So once again, some symptoms very similar to the survivor's symptomatology, traumatic you know, symptomatology. And once again, it's directly related to um, uh, digesting the details of the survivor's traumatic event. What is burnout? Okay, so as I already mentioned, very repetitive. Um, 
an emotional and behavioral impairment that results from chronic exposure to high levels of occupational stress. So the key link is occupational stress, okay? And it can include mental and physical exhaustion, indifference and cynicism. Cynicism is a key word where you're just like, there's, there, there's nothing positive you can say about um, the get up and go to work. Uh, sense of low personal professional accomplishment as well. Just feeling just, this is, what am I doing? And what am I getting out of this? And I'm just, this is, this is not working for me. Not one bit. What a secondary trauma. Uh, so as mentioned previously, that natural stress-related consequence that results from knowing about or witnessing a traumatizing event experienced by someone else. It is immediate and it can mirror the patient's, I mean, the other individual's trauma. And then once again, the compassion fatigue, the overarching cumulative effect, the empathic exposure, um, and the consequence of empathic engagement. Okay. So I think it's important a lot of times, and especially when one has experienced this, we kind of turn with them and we think it's just me. Why can't I motor through? And actually in different cultures, that feeling might be even more prominent. You know, I, I, I can handle this. I can handle this. I can motor through this. Um, and so it's important to think about that there's multiple factors that fold into this. There, there can be organizational factors. It can be the, the, the exposure and the amount of exposure to this content. It can be individual factors. So it's just not one thing. And that's really important because a lot of times the individual just thinks it's just all them, that there's something wrong with them, that they can't just motor through this. So some of the risk factors can be jobs and their roles, it can be prolonged exposure. It can be possibly even their own history or no history of personal traumatization. Um, it could be our own personal schemas and our own kind of makeup resiliency, our own level of support. Personal history versus life circumstances. Once again, life is trajectory, so things change over time. Our personality, our work ethic, so that can be folding in some of our styles and our boundaries, things of that nature. The level of empathy, I hate to say lack, um, or the, the area of enhancing our coping skills, how we navigate these things. Um, okay, I see how things are adding. Um, and sometimes it can even include kind of the level of experience training uh, that an individual may have uh, as well um, in their personal jobs and roles. So are, are we all susceptible? Absolutely. So as I've already mentioned, some of the risks can be the volume of exposure, the amount of support, social isolation. And so we're just going to like put a pause there in the context of the pandemic. Oh my goodness, um, you know, we've all experienced this component of social isolation and how do we navigate that and still be providers to, to children and families. Um, sometimes it can be, you know, young age, less job experience, personal trauma history, and then resilience, you know, the ability to take that carve that time out and to reflect opportunities for emotional intellectual closure. Um, I don't know about you, but once again, over these past few years, it feels like the days are just running together. And, and even here we are, we have these opportunities at times to work from home and we think we might have more flexibility, but kind of the Zoom world is like relentless. And um, at least I'll just raise my hand on that. And, um, and sometimes it doesn't always afford that opportunity to take a pause and take a step back. So, so we have to force that. Um, and then when we just talk about our positions, adequate staffing, you know, once again, context of COVID, you know, people have been home. Sometimes they can't come in. So then our staffing decreases, it changes. Um, and especially when we're talking about our students, when we don't have our consistent teacher or that just changes, um, that has an impact on our students as well. So once again, 
so many people have educated me and I, I, I learned from so much. And um, one of my colleagues, this was one of her quotes, which I love, love, love. When trying to help a broken person, always remember that you may be hurt by their shattered pieces. And this is okay. All right. So this, once again, this is another just comment that really resonates with me. Um, so now I get into some slides that are, the print gets so small. <laughs> so now kind of thinking about this, the vicarious trauma toolkit model and how things sort of break down. And because um, I like to kind of transition from things that are all bad to things that can be positive. And so we kind of trickle down a little bit where is a change in worldview, spectrum of responses. So there could be negative responses where we can have the vicarious traumatization, the secondary traumatic stress, compassion fatigue, neutral, impact manage effectively, We're just trying to move through these, through these hits, basically daily hits at times. Um, and then the positive can be vicarious resilience. And we'll talk about this a little bit more. Vicarious transformation, compassion, satisfaction. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. And as we, and even I'm not going to, well, clearly I'm going to provide those definitions, but just now that I throw, threw them out there, I want you to kind of reflect upon yourself a little bit, because some of those positives, you might be thinking like, well, how am I getting through every day and doing the work that I do? It might be that bucket right there. Okay, I can't see the top. Okay, so manifestations of uh, symptoms that the toolbar is in my, the top of my slides, so I can't read them. Um, so as I have muted myself. Okay, as these things pop up, I will see what my slide is. Okay, so these must be some symptoms, manifestations of some symptoms of uh, vicarious trauma compassion fatigue, um, hyperarousal symptoms. So one can experience um, nightmares, difficulty concentrating, being easily started, sleep difficulties, repeated thoughts or images re regarding the traumatic events, especially when you're not trying to think about them, feeling them, feeling unable to tolerate strong emotions, increased sensitivity to violence, generalized despair and hopelessness, and loss of idealism, Guilt regarding your own survival and or pleasure, cynicism, anger, disgust, fear, all these things. Okay, I'm gonna pull all these up because I don't know why I even set my, my, my slides like this. Um, so difficulty setting boundaries and separating work from personal life. Uh, feeling like you've never had time or energy for yourself, feeling disconnected from loved ones, um, at times, one can experience increased conflict in their relationships. So they might be a little bit more irritable and snappy, um, experiencing sort of like the, the, the silencing response where you're unable to pay attention to other people's distressing stories because they seem so overwhelming and incomprehensible. Um, and, and directing people to talk about the distressing material less. Like, I, I don't want to hear about it. Just um, general social withdrawal, decreased interest in activities that used to bring one pleasure, uh, feeling those um, symptoms of irritability, feeling easily agitated and tolerated, moody, um, at times experiencing increased dependencies. Uh, so this, this can happen as well. That could be involving nicotine, alcohol, food, sex, shopping, internet any other substances as well. It could be difficulties, sexual difficulties, impulsivity. So the, the list can go on and on. So this is, this is real uh, as far as what one can possibly experience. And it can be very in, in, in impactful in their overall function, right? really what cl clouds their thinking um, and thoughts and just their overall well-being. Now, um, how do we manage? Okay, so those, as I mentioned, those symptoms are real. And if we are trudging through all of that, how do we navigate that? How can we pull ourselves out of it? But I like to focus on the purple ring. Now, once again, we've got to get our eyeballs and focus because it's not the it's sort of small print. But this is the act of coping. Okay, so find humor. Pay attention to your feelings. 
get some sleep, okay? Exercise, walk. And so, you know, I'm one of those people where I'm like, when I hear, oh, just exercise, I'm like, okay, yeah, okay, sounds nice and easy. What are you talking about? So I'm a full supporter of five minute burst, 10 minute, just if you're working at home, just walk outside, walk down the block, come back. Just, just go outside, get some fresh air. If you need to stick your head out the window, it doesn't matter. Okay. Go up and down your stairs real quick. You know, um, just, just, just once again, thinking, not thinking I'm going to work out. With, and if you can work out for an hour, good for you. But for most of us, um, if you can just, just once again, take a walk for five minutes or 10 minutes and just, just do that. That is excellent. Um, you know, uh, find an acceptance in, 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 in what's going on and how do you navigate this? Um, reaching out to others, asking for help, uh, you know, talking to other people, joining a group. Uh, when you think about your day, kind of setting, setting some realistic priorities. So just, just, just looking at that. And once again, you may be falling in this area if, once again, if you've experienced some of the previous mentioned um, symptoms, and this is how you're navigating. So it's 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 not all bad. Um, so I, I said I was going to talk a little bit about these these terms. So vicarious resilience and vicarious transformation. So what this means is drawing inspiration from a victim's resilience that strengthens your own mental and emotional fortitude. So I spent most of my career uh, working with children in the foster care system. And I remember when I first got my, my first job uh, that was um, kind of leading a behavioral health team that provided services to only um, children in the foster care system. You know, I thought, oh my gosh, this is gonna be, I don't know how this is gonna be. And, uh, it, it was a transformative experience and even to this day. And the reason is because those kids and um, you know, their foster families, their biological families, you know, at times they they were they were inspiration to me. You know, the kids in particular, despite whatever horrible tragedy they may have experienced, um, you know, I always like to underscore when we, when we talk about traumas, I would always tell the workers that. Sure, you know, the what might have led them to be placed in the system was very traumatic, but most definitely when they have to switch to a new home two to three times a year and in the middle of the night, put whatever they can grab into a Safeway plastic bag and go to a new home and start a new school. And it doesn't matter how smart they are, but they're always still behind because once again, they started a new school. That's traumatic. And so, but with these kids, with those challenges, they would still you know, bounce into my office, you know, if they're, if, if, you know, I would say to them, oh my gosh, you look so cute today. Your hair is so cute today. I mean, they would, they would beam, they were still kids. And so literally day in, day out, I, I, they, they, I drew inspiration from them and they really um, shaped me personally and professionally. And so literally until I began to learn more about compassion fatigue, and that was, you know, kind of years into my career, I was like, ah, that was it. That's, that's what got me through that. That was it. Um, so similar to me, maybe you have experienced this as well. Compassion satisfaction, the sense of meaning that is gained from working in the fields of victim services and first responders. Um, so, uh, you know, once again, there can be some satisfaction of, of, of the work that you're doing and the gifts that you're given for your presence, for your patience, for your nurturance. Um, and that's very powerful and protective. So as a uh, note, 50% of Colorado child protection staff experience high or very high levels of compassion fatigue. You know, so this is real. So it can be in that service role, a large percentage of the people that are uh, in these roles experience compassion fatigue. So individual strategies for mitigation. Let me just check my time. Um, 
So this is good health practices. So I mentioned actually good sleep. I failed to mention good nutrition, feed and nurture your body. And yes, I'm sure you've heard it before, um, but this is the time to do it. It is so important and exercise. And as I said, shoot, if you got your 30 minutes and your 60 minutes that you can put in and grind down, whoop, it's, it's, I, let me bow down. But if you were like me, where, I mean, I feel like I'm like a walking hot mess every day, um, just trying to catch my breath, get out, just walk, walk outside real quick. Sometimes, and even in the winter, it was just like, if I just stick your head outside, just do something, because that, that, that cold wind would just kind of jar you up. That, that would be me, just kind of, kind of put me in shock. So just some movement. And this could be at your desk. This can, you know, but five minutes, five, 10 minutes, just take that walk. It could be a wonderful thing actually in just connecting, you know, you know, you may live in a neighborhood where just walking out and then you, this would afford an opportunity to talk with someone. So to socially engage and or, you know, your family members, um, just, you know, instead of you, you know, people, it's just a, this quick busyness that, okay, we're, we're all going to just take a quick walk. Um, enjoy, nurture your hobbies, families, friends, faith community. I underscore faith community because certainly in the context of this pandemic um, and certain, in certain cultures, for sure, that um, the faith community has been so important for them. And literally that was kind of, you know, the, the ability to go to church and to be in a worship service and to be in that community and be in some activities related to your church, that was kind of stripped away from the pandemic. And so I think, you know, slowly people are getting more opportunities there, but that's really important. And so how to kind of reconnect in that um, for certain people where this was a big part of their lives. Um, and as I said, underscoring those hobbies, dig back in if, uh, you know, you used to draw, whatever it might be, read, buy a book, do it. Um, recognize and accept personal, um, professional and personal limitations. So once again, I mean, it sounds, you've heard it before, but I'm just going to underscore it. You know, we can be everything and, and all we can do is do our best. And that's that. And our best has so many strengths and it has some areas of enhancement because we're human beings. And so it's really important to identify and embrace those things. Seek formal therapeutic interventions. So we have EAP programs, employee assistance programs, extremely uh, wonderful resource. Um, our own individual psychotherapy it could be group, um, group therapy, but Lent groups are really um, more shaped in kind of this uh, professional clinical world where uh, you're in a group with amongst professionals and um, it might be a time where um, they're talking about sort of the, the stressors in the context of their work. Um, it may even be as they may share, you know, cases, things of that nature, but it's, it's in that professional um, realm. Sometimes uh, we really have to look at our, 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 our roles and our positions. And I mean, you know, sometimes we have to make a change and change can be hard, but that's the work that we have to do to have that self-assessment. Um, connecting with our coworkers, sharing our thoughts, um, listening to their perspectives, share your perspectives. Um, you know, really digging deep about um, navigating uh, how you as a person um, best navigate stress and coping. Maintain realistic goals, limits, boundaries. Very important, very important. Um, after, you know, I'm, I'm just gonna say content because I think once again, as educational providers, you get content every day. And so it might be in that quick five minute walk that I'm a strong supporter of that you have this moment of self-reflection after what I, you know, what we would call an exposure. Self-monitoring, so assessment of your reaction, changes of behaviors, you know, take it in. If you're hearing more from your children or your significant others that you kind of have a funky answer, I don't know. 
wow, this is bubbling up a little bit too much. We got to be open to take that in, okay, and integrate that into what may be going on. Journaling, of course, I'm, I'm a big supporter of, you know, focusing on the positives, focus on what you did right. Once again, we're only doing our best. And mindfulness, being in the moment, being in the moment as well, um, and appreciating those things in the moment. Additional strategies for mitigation. Um, definitely, if, if you have a multidisciplinary team, uh, lean on it. Lean on it. It's so important. Acknowledge that you know the outcome does not rest solely on one individual's shoulders. Um, and, you know, if if you have kind of a supervisory level or relationship, you know, reviewing cases, sharing information can be really um, helpful as we process certain cases. Um, you know, at times kind of turn some of this passion into power, you can be in research, education, advocacy. Uh, I'm a big supporter of this, use your leaf. And I know there's many of you in the audience where you just, you just motoring through and you're one of those people where you can donate your leaf, all of that. Don't stop it. Mm -mm. Use all your leaf. You earned it, you worked for it, and you need it. You do, period. Um, Leave work at work, of course, you've heard this before, and it's tough, but that's where these other strategies work in. Five, 10 minute walk, um, embracing some of your hobbies again, carving out 30 minutes to read a book, um, whatever it might be that you're able to disconnect a little bit from work and be, once again, in a space where you're just being you and, and what brings you joy and peace. Uh, certainly in the professional context, if you see something about a coworker, say something to them, you know, let's support each other. Okay. Organizational strategies of mitigation. So um, it is really important for organizations and I mean, even for us to be joined together for this um, conversation about compassion fatigue, I think is a strong sign that organizations are trying to be more mindful of this that um, just to understand, accept, and appreciate that secondary trauma, burnout, compassion, fatigue, they exist and they are real and it's happening. Um, workplace, maybe introducing workplace mandatory preventative initiatives, you know, clearly a lecture like this can be one of them to, um, with the hopes of combating the, the effects of these repeated exposures. Um, and once again, in that educational workforce, you all experiencing it so often. Optimizing workforce capacities and responding proactively to a workforce that must operate under elevated levels of stress. So this is important. I mean, period. And I mean, you know, organizations, they can come up with many excuses, but this is the bottom line. We have to look at the workforce capacities. I mean, COVID has been a big assault um, because people, um, at times are forced not to come to work, period. How do we navigate that? How do we respond? This is, this is really important. And so, um, and how do we support in these levels, elevated levels of stress? It cannot be ignored. So some other strategies that the Child Traumatic Stress Network um, uh, suggests. So strategies for prevention, psychoeducation, clinical supervision. So of course I put that word clinical, but you know, levels of supervision, ongoing skills training, um, informal form of self-report screening. So once again, this is your own kind of self-assessment, workplace self-care groups, um, really important in creation of a balanced caseload. Um, so once again, this is about the workforce capacities, times flex time scheduling, what does the scheduling look like? Uh, I love this self-care accountability buddy system, okay? Sometimes we just got to check in with that one person. Um, the utilization of evidence-based practices. And then once again, here it is again. It's not going to go away. Exercise, good nutrition. Uh, strategies for intervention. So this can be, um, it can be uh, cognitive behavioral interventions, mindfulness training, that can be really helpful. I know even for our kiddos, that's really helpful. Um, kind of bringing in those professionals to teach the students and educational staff this. Um, 
once again, the supervision piece, reflective supervision, case loads adjustment. Um, certainly when there has been a crisis, informal gatherings to really um, debrief about these events. And here it is again, at times when we really have to do our own self-reflection about why do we do the work we do? What is the measure of success? I told you those questions would come into play. You know, at times we might need to change our job assignment, <coughs> excuse me, or work group. And then certainly referrals to an employee assistant or program or any outside agencies. So um, I know this is a lot and I feel like I just ran through it. So the takeaway points. So as I've already said, you are the front line to everything. And I know there's family members in the audience as well. And so certainly this, this I'm speaking to you um, when we're talking about what we might see in our kiddos, what we as parents might be experiencing and or family members, we might be caregivers to elders, just multiple levels. Um, we're the front line. And so we have to protect ourselves. We have to fortify ourselves. We have to take care of ourselves, period. And we have to be mindful of this on a daily basis. Uh, so in order to educate care for your students, you must acknowledge the depth, breadth, and impactful work that you do each day with all of its challenges. The other thing, yes, we appreciate you. Um, and you need to appreciate you and, and what you do every day, which is actually changing life trajectories. And it is complex and it is challenging. And you need to acknowledge that. Cannot say enough, you have to care for yourself. Um, and extend your team. As I said, I said from the beginning, I'm literally as a child analysis psychiatrist, I cannot do the work that I do without educational staff, period. I cannot do the work that I do without families, you know, parents. We are a team. Um, and so it's so important to extend your team and not work alone and isolate yourself. Also, you must believe deeply that you and your students, your clients, um, their families are resilient, and so are you. And with positive support, you know, you, they can transition through the most difficult things. Um, so really kind of think about that, those elements of um, compassion, satisfaction, satisfaction, vicarious um, transformation, that, you know, these elements are really important. All right, well, I will end it there. Left some room for any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Collins. Um, we do have a few questions for you. And um, so I am gonna go ahead and um, get started. You can go ahead. There you are, awesome. All right. So um, our first question, um, uh, the, the parent was concerned about maybe uh, something that you might have said earlier around, um, does burnout not apply to stay at home parents? How or how might it apply? Oh my gosh, <laughs> that, okay, stay at home parent is a job. Yes, absolutely. It applies 100%, period. Any, any suggestions? I know you've, you've made some strategies, you've talked about some strategies today, and we do have a lot of families and parents on with us this morning. Um, so, um, I know you did talk about, um, you know, things to do quickly, you know, get out of the house, take a quick walk. Um, what might some other things that families might be able to do if they're home all the time with their children? Um, well, you know, it's, it's, I don't want to say it's the same thing, but it's the same concepts is really thinking it, and it makes it even more difficult um, because everybody's in the same spot. But thinking about um, how the day can be broken up somehow, some way, where it is infused with moments of, of peace, of moments of, um, of being able to reflect, of moments where there can be some exercise. So I actually uh, have a whole nother, you know, given a whole nother presentation, that's actually, it was in the beginning of the pandemic where what do we do? You know, we're all at home. How do we do this? 
And um, it can be, you know, that exercise piece, once again, that can be taking the kids to the park if you can, and they're doing something and you're doing something. Um, it can be, once again, I think it's very important to uh, also enlist help. Sometimes that's not always you know, possible, but where do those pockets of help come in so that the stay-at-home parent can have some moments of their own privacy and down, downtime as well? A lot of times the most realistic is when the children are asleep. So what does that look like? Um, you know, doing parallel things, you nurture your body, you nurture your kids' bodies as well, so that it's a whole family concept as far as healthy nutrition um, and even healthy exercise. A lot of times, I mean, there, there are parents where they're like, okay, everybody, come on, let's put your walking shoes on or get your scooter out. We're going, this is going to be 10 minute, you're helping mommy. This is going to be the 10 minute power walk so that I continue to be great. So there's many things, and, and kids, bless their souls, they do like to help their parents at times. So it's kind of um, encompassing things that where they feel that they're being a helper, and they're certainly really helping mommy with work. Um, they can like that. Now, of course, they like their own downtime as well. And you know your kids. And so what does that look like? Um, and... Um, of course, nap times, and it depends on what the age is as well. There could still be some um, uh, home learning, and what does that look like? But they're trying to infuse the day with moments where the, the kids somehow, you're providing monitoring, but they can be autonomous in whatever play that they're doing and or work, uh, that can provide some level of disconnect. But, you know, Sally is really tough. Um, the, the, the stay at home professional, um, which is what you are, is, is one of the toughest professions. And, um, and sadly, sometimes those downtimes don't come until everyone's quiet and asleep, but then you're tired too. So I hope some of those things are helpful. Thank you. Um, so someone made a comment. Um, so all, all of these definitions, they, they sound like depression a bit. Is there a difference? Yes, um, there is a difference. Um, so certainly, and the, the individual's right, when we're talking about that mood component, that a lot of times that the individual is experiencing irritability. So, um, so irritability, feeling more moody, just you know, not feeling positive. So, and that can be um, a, a prominent mood symptom in the context of uh, depressive symptoms. How it's different. So depressive symptoms can um, encompass many other things as well. The, um, as far as the secondary trauma in particular, um, where the symptoms might reflect the survivor's uh, symptomatology, that hyperarousal hypervigilance that increased startle response is not something that we always see in uh, full-blown depression. So those certain things. Um, also, they may also experience nightmares as well. But certainly, which can be similar, is some disruption in sleep, some disruption in our, our attention and concentration. Um, so they can be similar, but they're different. Thank you so much. Uh, we have another question. How do you know when we have reached a point of crisis with our level of compassion, fatigue, or burnout? What signs should we look for? I think, I mean, you know, we, we hope in some of these strategies, hopefully we can, we can get to the point where we, we might be seeing it a little bit more. But a lot of times it happens where people get to the point where they just really say, I, I'm just not myself. This is, this is not me this, you know, how I'm responding to others, I'm snappy all the time, all these things. Um, that's, that at times is the telltale sign. And then you kind of have to say, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? Because this is not myself. I cannot um, keep functioning this way. So a lot of times that's where people, 
it, it really is becomes an epiphany, so to speak, where they notice that you know these 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 what they're experiencing is uh, not who they are typically, and and not how they want to be functioning and moving through the world. Um, so I have one of our educators asking this question. As a special education teacher, I am supposed to be the help. How do I ask for it without feeling, for lack of a better word, weak? Yeah, you're not alone. And that's 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 part of, you know, part of all this is this this also piece of you know being brave and, and asking for help. Um, Trust me, you are not alone. So that is the most important thing. If we don't ask for help, we're not going to get it. So the the tough thing is um, is identifying people at work, and sometimes it's it's your it's your right there colleague that you can just touch base with and be like, "How are things going?" You know, finding you know in this particular class that. It's been tough. What about you? Um, so there are ways to begin to broach that topic, but it has to be a willingness to begin to 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 reach out to others. Um, if you really want it to be in a in a more private way, once again, the employee assistant program, excellent, um, and that can be a confidential way to really reach out. Uh, but once again, a preventative measure can be those light touches when you are communicating with one of your colleagues and or if you feel comfortable communicating with your supervisor, just saying, you know, this was a tough day. Let me tell you the two reasons why I was. Um, you know, I'm trying my best here, but ugh, I'm just feeling deflated. Do you ever feel that way? Or, you know, help me. So. It's definitely tough to ask for help, but we must do it. Thank you. So another question from a family. How do you deal with the guilt as a parent when you're getting overwhelmed? Yes, well, once again, I'm, I'm, I'm probably gonna sound like a broken record. You are not alone. Um, it's okay. That's, that's the thing. And it, it goes back to one of the, the statements in my slides that um, we can only do our best and, um, and we, we can't do everything. Um, and um, period. I, I, I'll even share this personal thing and I don't encourage anyone to function like me or think like me, but basically when I had children, I was like, oh, okay, well, I see that I'm gonna be functioning suboptimally in every aspect of my life. Um, and what I meant by that, and I still live by is, you know, I'm gonna do my best, but I can't be at the Valentine's Day party. I might not be at the Halloween parade. I, you know, all these things where I wish I was, but I can't. And so, that's a reality as a parent where there are just elements that are extremely overwhelming. And, um, and then there's elements that, you know, we might excel in. And yes, we, we want to give our children the best, but the best is you, the best. That's the only thing that actually kids care about. They might say, yes, they want their Roblox and all these other things, but they just want mommy to be okay. And so once again, kind of flipping things, saying, mommy needs this, you're gonna help mommy, give me five minutes here, da, da, da. And it's okay because that is what you need um, and what they need. And so the guilt doesn't go away auto, you know, automatically, but these can be some measures um, to begin to kind of peel away that guilt a little bit and just feel okay with, um, not being everything all the time because it's impossible. Dr. Collins, I think we're gonna end on that note. And we wanna thank you so very much for speaking with us today. Um, our community and our families appreciate the information you've shared. And um, we wish everyone the best. Um, and um, thank you again for um, 
joining us and supporting our, our families and our educators today. So thank you everyone. Bye-bye.